I'm not here today to have a verbal jousting match with Manoj Kamarka. I have too much respect for him and his work for that. Instead, I hope to convince you of the truth of this statement. And more than that, I hope to also lay to rest some of the persisting myths around the ESP block to enhance your understanding of how to best utilize it and to gain the maximum benefit from ESP blocks for your patients. Now, the reason we're even having this debate is that when we first described the ESP block seven years ago, our understanding of the anatomy of the paravertebral region was patchy and incomplete. Back then versus now, the only posterior wall blocks that were described were the paravertebral block and intercostal nerve blocks. And so we struggled to understand what we were seeing with the clinical effects of the ESP block. Much of the early literature represents the process of evolution in our understanding, our attempts to feel our way towards the truth. And the process of scientific discovery is naturally messy and contentious, and it's not that surprising that there have been conflicting studies and opinions over the years. The most recent work that has been published, however, I think settles a lot of the debate. To date, the micro-CT work by Cho and colleagues is, in my opinion, the most definitive illustration of paravertebral anatomy. And what they've shown is that all the spaces that we target in the various posterior thoracic block techniques are connected by discrete anatomical pathways. The plane deep to the erector spinae muscle and its investing fascia is continuous with what they call the retro-SCTL, or the superior costal transverse ligament space, which in turn connects with the paravertebral space through openings in the musculoskeletal tissues that span adjacent transverse processes. The most prominent of these structures is the SETL, which has traditionally defined the posterior border of the paravertebral space. But it's by no means the only structure, and the generally accepted umbrella term, for simplicity's sake, is the intertransverse tissue complex. The most important point is not that it is a complete barrier, but that there are gaps in it. The most important point is that, is that it the most important point is that it is not a complete barrier, but that there are gaps in it. And thus, local anesthetic injected into one space can reach others and act on the structures contained within. In particular, if we perform an injection deep to the erector spinae muscle fascia within the ESP plane, there is no significant barrier to spread into the retro SCTL space where local anesthetic acts on both the dorsal ramus but also the spinal nerve and dorsal root ganglion within the intervertebral neural foramen. There can be further spillage of local anesthetic through the medial and lateral slits into the true paravertebral space where it can then act on the ventral ramus and intercostal nerve. Note that local anesthetic penetration of the SCTL into the paravertebral space is not actually necessary to block nociception in the spinal nerve because the retro SCTL space is in direct continuity with the neural foramen where the dorsal root ganglion is located and the DRG contains the cell bodies of all sensory neurons. These anatomical observations are consistent with the results of studies of spread in live humans, which I think we can all agree trumps any cadaveric investigation of spread. Anna Schwartzman and colleagues were among the first to conclusively demonstrate with MRI imaging that the ESP block does indeed result in physical injectate spread to the paravertebral space and even the epidural space. They injected 30 mils of 0.25% bupivacaine at T10 in six patients. Notably, all their patients had complete resolution of their chronic abdominal pelvic pain 30 minutes after the ESP block. And most recently, this 2023 study by Soren Stewart and colleagues confirms this spread pattern. They also injected 30 mils of 0.25% ropivacaine with contrast in 10 volunteers at T7 and 60 minutes later, similarly performed an MRI to examine the distribution of the injectate. And their results confirmed that local anesthetic injected into the ESP plane reaches the intercostal space, the paravertebral space, and the neural foramina. Local anesthetic will thus surround and act on the neural structures within these spaces, blocking nociception. How then do we reconcile this with the fact that there is often patchy or little detectable cutaneous sensory loss over the thorax? And some of this may be due to a suboptimal technique, which I'll elaborate on later. But in short, the endpoint that we initially recommended of linear spread across the posterior aspects of the transverse processes likely represents local anesthetic that is mostly contained within the thoracal lumbar fascial sheath of erector spinae muscle, and that this barrier probably limits the anterior spread of local anesthetic.
However, I will note that Soren Stewart and colleagues did find that the extent of detectable sensory loss to cold and pinprick on the skin did not correlate well with the MRI images and often underestimated the physical spread of injectate that was visible. So a related and more relevant question is, can meaningful analgesia exist in the absence of clinically detectable cutaneous sensory block to traditional testing measures such as pinprick and cold with ice? And in my opinion, the answer is yes. In fact, the same phenomenon is seen with tap blocks. Detectable cutaneous sensory loss is so highly variable between individuals, yet we recognize the clinical analgesic value of this block in lower abdominal surgery and cesarean sections. And there are two reasons that this can happen, fractional distribution and differential block. We know that the local anesthetic we inject into the ESP plane distributes not just into the erector spinae muscle, but into all the interconnected spaces. The spread though is consistent with any spread of fluid that radiates out from the point of application in a diminishing manner. So it's only a certain fraction of this volume that surrounds the neural structures within these spaces. Now the exact fraction and mass of drug that reaches and acts on these neural structures will vary from patient to patient. And it can depend on anatomical factors that influence resistance to bulk flow, which is one reason we tend to see greater effects in pediatric patients, older patients, and slimmer patients who tend to have more elastic tissue. Technical performance factors may also contribute, the exact needle placement location, and velocity of fluid injection, which in turn relates to the volume injected and the pressure generated. Now this fractional distribution can be both a limitation but also a strength of the ESP block. For example, the fact that only a small fraction reaches the epidural space and sympathetic chain explains the very low incidence of hemodynamic stability seen with the ESP block as compared to a paravertebral block. And this fractional distribution can be both a limitation but also a strength of the ESP block. For example, the fact that only a small fraction reaches the epidural space and sympathetic chain explains the very low incidence of hemodynamic instability seen with the ESP block as compared to a paravertebral block. The second fact is that below a particular threshold concentration of local anesthetic, different nerve fibers will exhibit different sensitivity to conduction block of action potentials. The smallest unmyelinated C fibers are the most sensitive and are blocked at lower concentrations compared to larger, more myelinated fibers. And it's these C fibers that transmit most of the nociceptive impulses, especially second or slow pain, with other sensory modalities, including sharp first pain, being transmitted in the larger fibers. The key in any future volunteer studies of ESP and other fascial plane blocks may be to test cutaneous sensation with more sensitive nociceptive stimuli, such as heat or cold pain using a QST device. Or we can just accept the fact that in clinical practice, we do see patients obtaining meaningful reductions in pain scores and opiate use when ESP blocks are performed. The other disparaging comment one usually hears about ESP blocks is that it's basically a proxy for intravenous administration of local anesthetic. I, however, don't think that this can be the primary mechanism for the clinical effects we see. Because firstly, evidence for a large effect of intravenous lidocaine infusion is somewhat weak. Second, it's not clear that peak lidocaine concentrations after a bolus reach the levels associated with intravenous lidocaine infusion, and they certainly do not remain there, so it doesn't explain the effects that we see with single injection ESP blocks. Finally, similar analgesic effects for intravenous ropivacaine and bupivacaine have never been tested, merely inferred. So to sum up, the ESP block does deliver local anesthetic to the spinal nerve root, the dorsal root ganglion, the dorsal and ventral rami, and thus it is capable of blocking nociceptive transmission from the periphery to the spinal cord. Compared to a paravertebral block, however, we can expect that with an ESP block, a smaller fraction of the injected local anesthetic and less mass of drug reaches the paravertebral space. Hence, a perfectly performed ESP will never produce neuroblockade that is as profound as a perfectly performed paravertebral block. So why would we ever choose good enough to do an ESP rather than a paravertebral block? For the same reasons why you might choose to do a fascia iliaca block rather than a lumbar plexus block. Because in the real world, it's hard to execute perfect blocks, unless perhaps you're as skilled as Professor Kamaka. <laughs>
Here's me struggling to visualize my needle and perform a pair of a chibo block. Note that we're using a curved probe because of the depth of the space. And incidentally, there was also a pleural effusion, which was the only thing reassuring me in trying to put my needle tip into that pair of a chibo space. And if we define good as intensity of conduction block that's achieved, then in most cases, the ESP block is good enough. And that is what the clinical evidence suggests. More importantly, there are advantages to being further away from the actual target of interest that are worth the trade-off of any decrease in conduction block intensity. And these chiefly have to do with simplicity, safety, and versatility, which have always been the attractions of the ESP block from the very beginning. Rightly or wrongly, the paravertebral block has always been perceived as a challenging technique and one that carries risks of significant complications. While pleural puncture is on everyone's mind, vascular puncture is an underappreciated complication. The intercostal artery runs in the paravertebral space and is at risk of puncture with potentially dramatic consequences as illustrated in this case report. I don't think that anyone would dispute that the ESP block is safer and simpler to perform and has much fewer relative contraindications. And this makes it highly versatile. It can be used where other blocks are not an option. For example, it can be employed in an outpatient catheter service as this group from Colorado described for their pediatric nurse repairs. Patients were discharged earlier and continue to benefit from the catheters post-discharge for up to seven days after surgery. Patients with an abnormal coagulation profile are another example of a population that has benefited from the availability of the ESP block as an option. And more importantly, it's a more accessible technique for practitioners who are not as skilled. It's the same reason again why the fascia iliaca block is so popular for hip fracture analgesia. It's safer and easier as an alternative to a lumbar plexus or even the femoral nerve block. Both ESP and fascia iliaca blocks are not always perfect, but the analgesia is almost always good enough. My experience as an educator over the last 15 years has taught me that the aptitude and enthusiasm for regional anesthesia varies amongst our trainees and colleagues. Some people are always going to be reluctant to learn advanced and potentially more risky techniques. And we have to respect that, but at the same time, give them alternatives. And this brings me to my next point. It doesn't always have to be one or the other. I think it's most valuable to think about ESP and paravertebral blocks as two ends of a physical and philosophical spectrum. Because the imaging and needle approach is so similar for ESP and the parasagal in-plane approach to paravertebral blocks, the motivated practitioner can graduate themselves from doing ESPs to paravertebral blocks. And while that is happening, more patients can benefit from regional anesthesia as a result. I don't personally believe that the ultrasound-guided paravertebral block is that difficult anymore, nor is it as risky, and I speak as someone who was never taught to do it. But this is exactly because I have now scanned the area so much in doing so many ESP blocks that I know that if I can get a good image, particularly of the pleura, and I can see my needle well, then I can put my needle tip safely into that paravertebral space. At the same time, and this is important, the reverse is also true. I can go into the procedure knowing that if for any reason I am unsure or having difficulty with guiding the needle to the paravertebral space, I can bail out, perform either an ESP or even an ITP block, and still provide the patient with much benefit. So as Bruce Lee would say, be water, my friend. So as I've said, I think it's valuable to think of ESP and paravertebral locks as just two ends of a spectrum. This is a typical parasatchel view through the tips of the transverse processes. And in an ESP block, we insert the needle just under the hyperechoic fascial line that separates the erector spinae muscle from the underlying intertransverse connective tissue complex. The paravertebral block, on the other hand, is performed by inserting the needle much deeper through that hyperechoic line that separates the dark fat-filled space just superficial to the pleura which, let's face it, is not always clearly visible. In any needle tip placement and injection between these two points into the intertransverse tissue complex, we would now call an intertransverse process or ITP block. Several other block names do come under this umbrella, of which the MTP described by Iwana Kostash was the first. But I do think in practice, there isn't much point in quibbling over these different names based on very fine anatomical details because a simplified model is useful for learning as long as it's accurate enough for practical purposes.
And really the only clinically important and relevant anatomical structures and landmarks are those that we can reliably and consistently identify on ultrasound. And these, in my experience, are the erector spinae muscle and fascia, the bony surfaces and shadows of the rib, transverse process, lamina, as well as the hyperechoic lines of the SCTL and the pleura. So any placement of the needle tip in any technique should be described in relation to these structures. When we first described the ESP block, we did simplistically describe it as an injection under erector spinae muscle, and we further said, just touch down on the bony transverse process for maximum safety. Our understanding of the anatomy at the time was so limited that initially we and others had thought that the thoracolumbar fascia encasing the erector spinae muscle was the container that directed craniocaudal spread and thus injecting within it was important for producing this pattern and the clinical effect. We now know that this is only true if your primary target for analgesia is the dorsal rami of spinal nerves and the posterior torso in the spine. If you're interested in the ventral rami and blocking the anterolateral torso, however, then it's critical to inject deep to the fascial sheath of erector spinae muscle into that retro SCTL space. You don't want to see muscle expansion or spread occurring above any of the bright fascial layers under the muscle, no matter how beautifully it is flowing and opening up in a craniocaudal direction. If you see this, you must insert the needle deeper. You want to see the muscle and its deepest fascia lifting and oftentimes even a swirling in the deeper intertransverse tissues. Now you could call this an ITP or even an MTP block, and I wouldn't quibble with it, because I think the most important thing is to understand for your patient what you're trying to achieve, how to do it, and what you can do in that moment with your probe, your needle, and the image that you have. One technical and anatomical point for successful ESP blocks that hasn't been emphasized much to date, but I think is critical, is not just where you place the needle tip with regard to the anterior posterior axis, but also the medial lateral axis. We now know that there are these two gaps that link the retro SCTL and paravertebral spaces. And the medial slit, or what others call the costal transverse foramen, is the closest passageway connecting the ESP and retro SCTL space to the proximal paravertebral space, where the spinal nerve root emerges from the neural foramen. So we must pay attention to the exact parasagittal plane that we are imaging and needling in terms of whether it is more medial or more lateral. So nowadays, I don't recommend necessarily trying to target the very tip of the transverse process because what often happens when you do that is that you can end up even more lateral in the plane of the rib transverse process articulation because this is where you tend to get a nice bright image of the bony surface of the proximal rib and the pleura and perhaps even the SCTL and it looks good. However, this is significantly more lateral. And as you can see from this intertransverse process view, it lowers the probability that you are going to get local anesthetic into that proximal area of the paravertebral space where the high value targets are, the dorsal root ganglion and the spinal nerve root. I think it makes more sense to ensure that we're imaging and advancing the needle in the parasagittal plane that is closer to the base of the transverse process rather than the tip what some might also call a paralamina plane. In practice, this means a plane where you still see the squared off shadow of the transverse process, but where the pleura and SCTL are barely visible, if at all. In this more medial parasagittal plane, any injection under erector spinae muscle is now closer to the medial slit or costal transverse foramen. And this increases the probability that we will get spread into the proximal paravertebral space rather than into the intercostal space. So, in summary, my recommendation is to always obtain and target this lower image highlighted in red and not the other one. I'm going to end with this slide, which summarizes some of my closing thoughts on when and why you should consider doing an ESP block rather than a paravertebral block. In my development as a clinician, I increasingly value flexibility and versatility as qualities. And I think that in this respect, the ESP and the related ITP blocks have opened up the scope of the benefits of regional anesthesia to so many more patients in so many more scenarios. So be water, my friends. Oh, and let's all just agree to be rabbits. Or was it ducks?